Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the new screensavers is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. The new screensavers is brought to you by Eero. Never think about Wi Fi again with Eero's hyper fast, super simple Wi Fi system. And now the second generation Eero is tri band and twice as fast. For free overnight shipping to the US or Canada, visit Eero.com and select overnight shipping at checkout. Then enter the offer code NSS. And by the Ring Video Doorbell. With Ring, you can see and talk to anyone at your door from anywhere in the world using your smartphone. It's like caller ID for your home. Go to ring.com slash NSS and get up to $150 off a Ring of Security kit. Speeding on an electric bike, a techie food feast, and powering the world wirelessly. Live from the Twit Eastside Studios in beautiful Petaluma, it's the new Screensavers. <laughs> Laporte here. Megan Maroney here. And it is our thanks post Thanksgiving episode mm -hmm. of the new Screensavers. But in case you're trying to watch this live, we actually already recorded this on Monday, but we're going to release it on Saturday because we didn't want anybody to have to come in after Thanksgiving. Right. And I had a wonderful Thanksgiving. I did hope. you? Yeah. I think I did too, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> but just in case you didn't have enough food, this is going to be kind of an interesting episode. We've got exercise. You're going to show us a new electric bicycle. Exercise. Exercise. <laughs> oh, that's right. You don't really have to do anything, do you, on your Not really. electric bicycle? We're also going to show you some cooking, Internet of Things cooking devices. We're going to have some fun. We're going to do some sous vide and beer tasting and, and all of that. We've got holiday gift guides. Not one, but two holiday gift guides. Ryan Shrout from This Week in Computer Hardware will give you his most performant PC gear picks. And then uh, you and I, I guess the cooking thing counts as a, as a holiday guide to cooking apparati. Actually, if you have a cook in the family, this is, this is really a lot of fun. And if you're the cook, you might be interested in this also. Uh, we will talk about a new technology. Uh, we did a whole triangulation on this with Alex Lido from Efficient Power Conversion. It's called Gallium uh, Nitride. It's a new kind of um, uh, semiconductor that really makes a big difference right now in terms of amplification, uh, charging, but eventually may even speed up microprocessors. We'll find out the inside scoop and get a little demo of gallium nitride technology. Uh, Jason Howell is going to show us the, the little donut-sized Google Home Mini and some new smart speaker speakers with the uh, unaccountable name Zolo Mojo. Hmm. I like the name. They have Mojo and they're Zolo. But <laughs> last week, you may remember, the folks from Noon came and modified your home. They did. They, I've been wanting to smarten up my home, as you know, for quite a while. It was my uh, New Year's resolution, and it's November, so <laughs> it's about time. I looked into the Hue lights, and they're, it just seemed complicated. I still have some, because this didn't solve all my problems, but I found this product called Noon Home Lighting. We went through, um, here's a little bit of what it looks like, because I have so many can lights. And then, uh, so what they do, instead of putting replacing all your bulbs with smart lights, they go through your electric system. So uh, you... It senses what your lights are. Right. It has this algorithm and it sniffs it huh. and finds out, do you have dimmable bulbs? So do you... Do you do, I'm glad that he was putting these switches. I'd be afraid of electrocuting myself. Yeah, I I did a little bit of the unscrewing and screwing in. Um, but yeah, you can you can do it yourself. A lot of people do uh, know how to change out a light switch. Um, you, you have and to turn I, off the like, power. Obviously. Yes, he yeah. did that. So. Uh, oh, look! So it's now detecting light bulbs. Yeah. So it detected them, and then it would know exactly what you have, and then it so, shows in uh, incandescent, flora, fluorescent, mm -hmm. and LED. Right, and whether they're dimmable or not. Because not all LEDs too. can be dimmed, and then yeah. it does that. Right. So then you can set scenes. So the idea is that maybe you want some lights on and not other lights on. Maybe you just want your porch lights on. Maybe you want it really bright, or maybe you want some mood lighting for something now, you're doing. Now, these are white bulbs. You can't make it like a hue bulb. You can't make a different color. Not yet. 
Not oh. yet. So they just came out of stealth mode. They have a lot of people that came from Nest that used to work at Nest that are um, that are part of this startup. Uh, their CEO actually came from Nest. So it's not like they're just, you know, this isn't their first rodeo, these guys. <laughs> uh, so I think they have, they couldn't tell me, but I think they have bigger plans for like the rest of the smart home. Well, of. they've done the main thing, which is to figure out what kind of lights you have. And did it work? Well, so now you've had them for a yes. while. How, how is it working? Uh, it was a little bit rough in the beginning. And that is partly because, as you know, my husband is a bit of a Luddite. And he came home and he said, like, what is he, what is going on here? Like, I just want to switch. I just want to turn this off and I well, want to turn this it on. it is true that... Frankly, dimmers and switches, they kind of work. They've been yeah. on a long time. They kind of get the job done. Right. And you can't so, do it from bed. No. Well, you could if you put it up in No, no, upstairs. I'm saying you noons you could, but I'm saying the old-fashioned switches. Right, you could. You have to get out of yes. bed or out of your armchair. Exactly. So this is for people, not Marco, your husband, <laughs> who don't want to stand up. Right. They don't want to stand up. And so... Uh, he was a little frustrated. Also, it wasn't working perfectly. Wait, wait a minute. Do you mean you can no longer use the switches normally? You can. But he you just can, didn't like how they but looked? partly, there's there are multi-way switches. And you saw that one that uh, has the screen. That's the room director. Yeah. And you have to use the room director that's to confusing. replace a like, switch. What is that? Yeah. Right. And so he liked to use that switch. Like, that was his favorite switch. Oh, you replaced his favorite <laughs> switch. <laughs> that's your mistake. Very, this is, I'm sure, like, this is a personal story, but I have to believe I'm not the only one out there who has, like, a partner who is not into all the technology they're we bringing into their home. We replaced Marco's favorite switch <laughs> with the noon switches. I know. Let's see what he does. Exactly. Ah! It was totally, like, yes, like a reality I kinda, show. I can't understand. So you didn't ask him ahead of time? I told him, but he was like, oh, okay, whatever. He didn't realize you would be replacing his favorite switch. <laughs> but the idea is that you can create whatever scene you wanted. Like his favorite switch turned off the light, so I just had to make a scene for him. Then that he touches was, it and it would and work. And it's exactly the configuration that he wanted. Did he like it after wanted. that? Once it, yes, except okay. that we had this, these six uh, bulbs that were the non-dimmable uh, like uh, bulbs, and they kept going off for whatever reason. Like we'd turn them on and then they would just turn well, off. What the noon people said is if you, if you don't have dimmable bulbs, We'll just take selective lights off to, to lower right. the overall lighting. Mm -hmm. Was that part of what was going I'm on? I'm not or? exactly sure what was going on. It's, you know, I mean, you've been there where you're like, everything's working perfectly except this one thing, which yeah. is incredibly annoying that you turn your lights yeah. on and then they turn off. And you're kind of committed once you change, right. <laughs> change all your switches. It's a lot of work to go back. Yes. Do you have to use this, the smartphone or an iPad or something to, to control this? Or once you've got it done, does the smart switch do what you want? You can do that. You can use the screen. You can use any of the switches. So they're connected to Wi-Fi, but if your Wi-Fi goes out, you can still use everything as a switch. Okay. Uh, as long as we didn't replace your favorite switch. You can use your phone. You can use the Amazon Echo. You know, you can, like, you create the scenes and you say, you know, Alexa, create, you know, turn on my right. uh, romantic scene or something like, like that. that. So, I like that. So, and so now the lights are working as designed. I think they just needed uh, to get used to us a little bit. I think part of the problem is we were using Alexa. We were using the switches. We were using the phone. Um, and giving it a lot too many signals. So now that we created all the scenes, it seems to be working. Even the ones that fine. were going off spontaneously have stopped yes. doing that. Okay. So far, <laughs> after now, a week. You can reassure Marco because the noon people are going to come and take this all out. <laughs> yes, they can. They they come and they'll bring an electrician yeah. and take it all out. Okay, and good. so he's okay. He's. He said, "Well, he's, I'm not crazy about this 21st century, but." Do, how about the the kids? Do the kids get it and Oops. use it? I mean, this is their generation, right? Milo's giving a little... Like, yeah, he likes it, but... By the way, um, that was Milo, your son, who started yes, the show, we yeah. should mention. Yeah, yeah. He, he's more techie. He got my uh, tech interest genes, so he, he likes them. Um, but, you know, they, it has some other features, like a vacation feature where it will know what your behavior is and then do that while you're So it's gone. better than a timer because it's going right. to be kind of simulating to your, your actual... Yeah. yeah, that's cool. Yeah, so... Um, how much? Well, we we said that last week. It's it is. I think the room director switch, like the main thing, the is things. two hundred. Well, okay. the, each of one of those is two hundred dollars. A starter kit, I think, is about four hundred dollars, which it. includes right. the. And then a hundred um, bucks for more switches yes. after. That. So okay. I think that everything that they installed in our house, Anthony figured out, was about twelve hundred dollars. <laughs> so that's a lot if you compare it to just regular hue lights that you might replace a few of. Yeah. But if you're, you know, a hue, a, like a layered lighting system, you've been in people's houses that have a layered lighting system. They get a lighting designer to come in, and you know, I you actually. Can control I don't know anybody <laughs> who does that. You know people who do that? I do. Some people, wow. yeah. Like Annabella has a friend who... Oh, that's a Yeah, she's like, designer. oh, she can come in and, yeah, probably wow. cost around $10,000. You come in, you know, you can control it, and then they, they leave like a giant hub behind. And so no this really is less expensive than bringing in a lighting designer. You could do it yourself. Yes. And a lot less money. Right. All right. Noon, N-O-O-N. 
just out of stealth and available now. What's the mm -hmm. website? Noon, Noonhome.com. Hey, I forgot to put the <laughs> potatoes in. Do you mind if I quickly run yeah, over? Yeah, go ahead. Go so ahead. So a little bit later on, we're going to show you Internet of Things cooking uh, devices in our uh, holiday gift segment. But one thing we're, you know, we don't as a we don't have a you know like 15 different ovens. So I got we've already got the uh, soft boiled eggs. They're almost done. The salmon's almost done. But I thought if we're going to do roast potatoes, this is a June oven. It's about fourteen hundred dollars. Not cheap. Internet connected. It comes with a probe. So if you're cooking a chicken, you could say cook it until the right temperature. And it comes with a camera, which is kind of wild. As soon as I close the door, it says, oh, you just put potatoes in, right? Yep, that's what those are. They could have been Brussels sprouts. Make sure that the, uh, the baking pan is in the middle. I'm doing that. And then it's going to say, well, you want to roast? Yeah, roast. You don't need to know the recipe. It'll take care of it. It's going to take 30 minutes. So in a half an hour, we'll have roast potatoes to go with our sous vide salmon and soft boiled eggs. <laughs> I don't know if those don't really fit into the overall thing, but so good. That's the June oven. And by the way, I can see what's going on. In fact, I'll show you over here with my phone. I can see what state they're in. I could stop the cooking. I can start it over again. Uh, I could even have put them in, not started it and started it, you know, from work so that they'd be ready when I get home. And that's one of the advantages of these internet of things devices that they work over the internet as well as in your house. So that, that's the June oven. We'll show you more about that in just a second. Uh, now that things are cooking, we've got the salmon. That's uh, sous vide -ing. I put the, I put a nice salmon filet. Mm. I prefer wild, but I think wild's out of season right now, so we had to use farmed, I'm sorry. Uh, and then little thin slices of lemons, a little bit of dill, salt, pepper, some butter. Should be good. Uh, but there's a finishing touch we'll have to do. We're going to show you some other things as well over there. And I, the soft-boiled eggs are my favorite use, and that's the mellow sous vide. We'll show you that. Um, all right, so now I want to show you this. I, a couple of months ago, bought my favorite Windows laptop. This is a ThinkPad, Lenovo ThinkPad. This is their X1 Yoga. And it is an amazing laptop with an OLED screen. I've talked about it before. All the great features of ThinkPads, including a great ThinkPad keyboard, the little nub that people uh, like, the track point. Of course, a great, uh, I think a really great trackpad. And because it's a two-in-one, it does, uh, watch, I can flip the screen over, I can use it. Uh, in tablet mode, I can use it in tent mode and movie mode. I like two-in-ones in general. Uh, for some reason, Microsoft's calling theirs a five-in-one. Uh, oh, updates are Tents, available. Tent, like pad, what? There's, they come up with other, other ways you can do it. <laughs> Behind the back. It's a, it's a convertible, all right? <laughs> and one thing that's kind of neat about the Lenovo ThinkPad is when you bend, watch the keys. When I bend the screen back, the keys retract. Oh. They actually pull in so that they're not going to be on the table at all when I put it down. Now, all laptops will disable the keys so they don't type, but this way they've got little bumps here and I can actually put it on the table and the keys are not going to hit the surface. So that is the one kind of cool feature. But $3,000 as configured, top of the line i7, OLED screen and all of that stuff. There is another yoga from Lenovo that they have put out. This is the Lenovo 920. This, the ThinkPad is really a business product. This is more a consumer laptop, an ultrabook, uh, and I think it is beautiful. Solid aluminum unibody. It's a little bit more like, you know, an Apple uh, a MacBook Pro or something like that. It's got a very small bezel screen that goes all the way around. And look at the hinge. What's going on there? Isn't that an interesting hinge? Can you get pinched? Have you gotten pinched? No, I haven't. It, it's uh, just kind of a unique pin, uh, screen that lets you do all of the two-in-one stuff. It doesn't retract the keys, but it is still the great Lenovo keyboard. It's very similar to maybe a little bit less travel than the ThinkPad keyboard, but very similar. Of course, no track point button. You know, this is more of a consumer-grade laptop. It is also uh, simpler in terms of connectors. It only has one Type A USB 3.1 connector and then it has two type C connectors on the other side which can be used for charging I think all laptops if I go if I buy a laptop from now on I want type C charging because it means I don't have to buy separate proprietary chargers I can you know I didn't take the charger out of the box I just used my uh, Aki type C charger and boom it's charging so that's great and so it has two of those those double as Thunderbolt 3.0 ports so that's high speed connectivity you can drive extra screens up to three different screens with this and a microphone and a headphone jack. Uh, but what's interesting about this, uh, this hinge is there's stuff in there. For instance, uh, Lenovo says, let me do the uh, fingerprint reader so I can log in. Lenovo says they've put uh, array mics in here, multiple mics, the kinds of things you find 
in, um, it's a touch screen, by the way, uh, the kinds of things you find in, um, uh, like a, a, a Echo and uh, the, the Google Home. So I'm going to call our Skype so we can hear what the microphone, if you'd answer the, my uh, call, Anthony. <laughs> Please answer his call. Uh, we're going to hear what the microphone sounds like. I'm not using a headset now. Turning off my mic, this is the microphone in the laptop. See? That's that is an array mic, and I think it sounds really good. So if you're going to use this for some sort of video, uh, Facebook Live or Skype, you won't really need a headset mic. I think especially if I'm sitting here as I would be at a desk, that sounds pretty darn good. You don't need a separate microphone. So that's one of the special little features of the Lenovo Yogo 920 that I was actually pretty impressed with. Let me close this out because it's kind of bad to talk to you. There, that's, there. That's, you, can, you can see this sounds better. Obviously, a real microphone, that but it's pretty good. It sounded pretty good, right? How's the battery life? Battery life is really good. It's, it, it's about 10 hours. I was able to go and go and go. That is not the case for the Lenovo ThinkPad, and that's primarily because of the OLED screen, which really uh, draws a lot of power. This is an LCD screen. Very nice looking screen. I'm very happy with this. Now, this is the one uh, that we got is configured with a Core i7. Of course, you can get an i5. It's integrated Intel HD graphics. I got it with, uh, I think, 16 gigs of RAM, but you can get eight gigs to save a little money. It goes all the way up to one terabyte NVMe SSD. I love those SSDs, they're very fast. 13.9 uh, inch, 3840 by 2160 uh, touch screen, or you can get the 1080p touch screen and say, again, save a little bit of money. Uh, I think the 1080p is, is just fine. I think this one is actually the little bit higher resolution UHD. I mentioned the Thunderbolt ports, the USB port. Pen? It will support a $69 pen. I do like the fingerprint reader for Windows Hello. Most Windows machines will either do like yours does. You mm -hmm. have a Surface Book, use the camera, and so it looks for you. The problem with that is you have to be positioned right in front of it and so forth. It's not as fast and easy as Face ID, so I kind of like the fingerprint reader that comes with this, and that's, that's generally how I log in. So it the doesn't do both, it just does one or the other? Or does it also have the camera? It does not have the camera, it only has the fingerprint reader. Nice speakers, JBL, I mean, no matter what kind of speakers you put in a laptop, they're still sounding like laptop speakers. If you want good speakers, you probably put the uh, external speakers. They claim 10.8 hours with UHD, and if you have uh, 1080p, they claim a whopping 15 and a half hours. And since I did, on my UHD version, get very close to that uh, number of 10 hours, 10.8 hours, I would say that if you really want battery life, get the 1080p, you'll be very happy. The touch screen, it's, don't you think it's really good looking? It is. You remember, your Surface Book also has a weird hinge, yeah, right? Scorpion this one's tail. a, I, I think this is kind of cool. It doesn't bother me, it's something to be aware of. It's also easy to grip, easy to handle, and it's full metal. Everything is, is solid metal, a little bit of chrome on the side to give it some, some styling. I really like this. I think this is an excellent uh, ThinkPad. Now, as configured, the one we've got here, I think is a little bit, I think it's about 1500 bucks. It ranges from 1200 to uh, $2,000, depending on you know how big a hard drive you put in, how much of a processor you put in. Uh, I just think it's wonderful. I'm very, very happy. I personally like the b more business style ThinkPad because it has more connectors. It has uh, HDMI, small mini, uh, full size HDMI out. It has a mini Ethernet. It's got three USB ports. It's got the Thunderbolt. So this is really the business version. It's also business. You can get it in silver, but that that soft touch black, that classic ThinkPad black, that that says business. This says more like a laptop for a student. Uh, somebody who, you know, a home user, anybody who wants a good-looking laptop that's very well built. I've always been a fan of Lenovo's ThinkPad line, but this ThinkPad Yoga 920 is excellent. Notice they come in gold as mm. well as silver. I'm very, very happy. A definite uh, recommend, um, definite buy if you're interested in a Windows laptop that looks good, feels good, and uh, has fairly good price. It's comparable, I guess, to the Microsoft Surface Book. I like it a little bit better. We're going to uh, go over and look at electric bikes. We're going to do some cooking. We're going to have a post-Thanksgiving feast mm -hmm. of salmon and soft-boiled eggs. <laughs> and Sounds coffee. And coffee and beer. <laughs> Sounds so good. But first, a word from another Internet of Things device. Actually, you know, I was just looking because I have so many Internet of Things devices in my house. I thought, let me log into my Eero and just see how many devices I have connected on my home network. 37. <laughs> 37 internet connected devices. Yeah, there's a few laptops, but there's also Echoes and there's TVs and there's Rokus and it just goes on and on. But all of them are driven beautifully 
by the second generation Eros I have here. The basic Eero base station that's connected to your internet and the two Eero beacons. Those plug into the wall, they have a little night light and they're twice as fast as the original Eero. Eero has been doing this longer than anybody else. It's been almost two years, hasn't it? Since Eero came out with their first mesh Wi-Fi, these guys, they started in early 2016, are doing an amazing job. They've learned because every single installation teaches them more about how people use Wi-Fi, what devices need more, what devices need less, and they can tune your network. In fact, it gets better and better as you use it. Plus, the thing I really appreciate, and in my opinion, this is, ought to be true of everything you put on your internet network at home, they automatically update. That means firmware patches when bugs like crack come out. This wasn't a bug that affected only Eero. It affected all devices that connect to Wi-Fi networks. And Eero had it patched within 24 hours of the revelation the crack existed. That's what I call fast work. And you didn't have to do anything. Your router was automatically put up to date by Eero. The Eero Beacon, the second generation Eero, are now tri-band. That's two 5 gigahertz radios and one 2.4. Uh, they automatically do handoff, which means everything's going to work great. And when you need more bandwidth in a certain spot, like on your Roku or your Apple TV, it's going to get it. They put in a thread radio. That's a special radio for low-power devices like locks and doorbells and other sensors. And it's so easy if you need more. You know, I gave the old Eero to my mom. And because her floor plan, she has two stories, but she also has a building out back, a studio. I gave her extra Eros. I set her up with five Eros so that it could cover her whole area. And it's just solved a massive problem for my mom. If you've been having trouble with your Wi-Fi, if you've had buffering or slowdown, you've got to check out Eero. E-E-R-O dot com. We've got free overnight shipping for you in the U.S. or Canada. If you go to Eero dot com, select overnight shipping at checkout and then put the promo code in NSS and that'll zero out the shipping cost. That's nice. E-E-R-O dot com. And don't forget the offer code NSS for free overnight shipping. Never think about your Wi-Fi. It just works. And I can testify to that because that's what I use at home. And you know, oh, I should show you another. I, well, I could go on and on. I the also family use it safety. At home. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, Milo can't get on the internet after 10 p.m. That's what happens in our house, right? We could still use the internet, but but uh, our 14-year-old, nope, no internet for you, kid. <laughs> uh, I love the sounds that come out of his room at around 10 o'clock at night. No! <laughs> come on! Uh, enough about the euro. Let us uh, move on. Are we going to go do electric biking? Is that what we want to do? Uh, or we're going to we do talk that to in Ryan just a bit. Shrout. First, let's do Ryan Shrout. Uh, these are we've been doing these holiday gift guides. They're so much fun. They are. In fact, um, we just did one on iOS today for our little giving things. Mm -hmm. uh, but right, we went to the the expert. Ryan Shroud is the editor in chief and has been for years at PC Perspective, PCPer.com. And we asked him, what would be if if power were your ultimate goal in a PC, what would you recommend these holiday season? And this is what he said. Hey guys, Ryan Schraub from This Week in Computer Hardware with some holiday picks for you on the PC side and for gamers and enthusiasts alike, right? We've got a lot of stuff sitting out here in front of me, so I'll run through it all pretty quick. First of all, um, a lot of this is going to be high-end gear. It's kind of a high-end holiday season in my in my house here as we look to upgrade graphics cards and look at new processors and platforms. We have the EVGA GeForce GTX 1070 Ti. This is their SC edition. The 1070 Ti is interesting as it was a, a card released by NVIDIA to compete against AMD's RX Vega products and it offers near GTX 1080 levels of performance but for like $50 to $100 less. And as of today as we record this, pricing is all relatively stable. You can find these for $469 or so uh, on Newegg or Amazon. Also from the storage side, we can't leave out uh, Alan's new favorite as well. We have the Intel Optane SSD. This is the Intel Optane SSD 900P. It's available in a 280 or 480 gig capacity. The fastest stuff you'll ever use. It's also pretty pricey uh, at $599 for the 480 gig capacity. So you're paying a lot for it. It's maybe twice as fast or twice as pricey as some of the other NVMe drives. But in terms of performance, cannot beat it. Uh, for people who are gamers, you're uh, always on the go or you're either um, trying to replace batteries on mice. Logitech came out with a new cool technology called PowerPlay. And they have two mice uh, that support it, the G903 and the G703. And what's interesting about these mice is they get paired with this mouse pad 
that is actually a wireless charger. So as you're mousing, gaming, or it's just sitting there idle, underneath the actual surface is kind of a coil charging system. So it's a wireless charging system. This plugs into your computer uh, or any USB outlet, I guess, that, that can supply power. And then your mouse is both wireless connectivity and wirelessly powered. It's actually pretty impressive stuff. The uh, the power pad itself, the mouse pad is pretty sizable. So even if you're uh, a high-end gamer enthusiast, I think you'll find enough of room on that mouse pad. It's about 99 bucks for the power play mat itself. And then you can choose either a $90 or $130 mouse to go along with it that gets you the wireless charging capability. For those of you who are looking to upgrade your full systems, you could look at, I'm still impressed by AMD's Threadripper processors. Um, you know, they are expensive. The uh, Threadripper 1950X is just under $1,000, $969 as I looked at it today. But you're going to get 16 cores, 32 threads of performance, quad channel memory, support for 60 lanes of PCI Express for add-in cards, either whether it be Optane drives or additional graphics cards. A lot of performance capability there and the first true competitor to Intel's high-end market segments as well. And one last thing that I had to include, because I am a Star Wars geek, I am wearing one of those shirts. If you have a Star Wars fan on your on your list and they are high-end gamers, you can look at what NVIDIA has released, these Titan XP graphics card special editions that happen to be either labeled as the Jedi Order or the Galactic Empire. They come in these cool display cases, but obviously if you're gaming, you're going to want to take them out of there. Uh, and you get to see essentially graphics cards that are modeled after lightsaber hilts. So this one's supposed to look like Darth Vader's lightsaber. These are $1,200, again, super expensive graphics cards, but that is the same price as the Titan XP normally. So you're not paying any premium for that at the very least. Uh, so that is, it, they just called the Titan XP Collector's Edition. It's available only at nvidia.com actually um, for that high-end PC gamer who is also a high-end Star Wars lover as well. So this is a, a lot of good gear, I think, for people who are interested in PC hardware and enthusiast tech. Check us out on This Week in Computer Hardware at twit.tv slash twitch. I'm Ryan Stroud, guys. Thanks. See you next time. Thank you, Ryan. Oh, those potatoes, they're cooking. Take a look. Ooh, they're going to look good in that June oven. We're roasting potatoes. And, you know, the truth is I don't really need you, Jerry, to take a look because I have a camera in that chair. In that June oven, this is one of those 37 devices connected to the internet. I can see the time and what's going on, but I also can actually look into the oven. Let me see if I can. Uh, you can sneak a peek. I can see oven. live video of the potatoes roasting. They're looking pretty darn good in there. It seems like that's kind of a violation of the potatoes' privacy. I can see what <laughs> elements are on. I can see what temperature. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, I love this Internet of Things stuff. This is a bicycle. There's there's nothing. What this is a tech show. There's nothing technical about this. It's an electric bike. It's <gasps> a but it's a pedal assist electric bike. I actually really want one of these. This is one of my. I, we have tested a lot of products this season. The last few months, this is one of my favorites. This is from eSpin e Sport. eSpin, and it's uh, it's a little cheaper than your average e-bike. I've seen them for three and four thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah. This one is a little. I think this one 1888 is. Eighteen eighty-eight. Yes, but there's the, the the battery is not in this bar. No, it's the in battery this bar is down here. here. Yeah. I mean, I when I rode it around, I think that people didn't necessarily know it was an electric bike because electric no. bikes kind of have a they have a Bad. Look at that. Yeah. That uh, looks so great. Pedal assist is, as you can see, if you're watching, I can pedal or I can just turn on the motor and it can just go by itself. Is that mostly for hills, tough areas yes. where you don't you don't have all the oomph you need? So the idea behind, behind the e-spin is that, or most electric bikes really, is if that, if the only thing that's keeping you from commuting to work is like that last big hill or you don't want to arrive sweaty, like if, if that's the reason you're driving a car every day to work, then try this because it'll just give you a little bit of a boost when you need it. I also feel uh, felt a little bit like Superwoman when I rode it. Um, so can you just ride it in battery the whole time? You can ride it in battery the whole time, or you can ride it slowly in battery the whole time. You can ride it really quickly in battery How the fast? whole time. How uh, fast? You can go up to about 25 miles an hour. The, the, it's say, limited at 20, but Milo uh, said he got to 28, and Huck yeah. said he got to 35. Uh, your mileage may vary. Right, especially going downhill. <laughs> I you think know, that's can the key. Go so there you go. You're going uphill. You're still pedaling a little bit, but I, was it easier? Yeah, way easier. I don't think, I mean, you know, Anthony was riding behind me in, uh, with a camera, and I don't think he could even get up that hill on a regular <laughs> bike, so. That's so mean. <laughs> I did, I, th I do feel like in, so, in some ways, yeah, it's not fair.
fair. Like that, that's why people are frustrated with e-bikes. Because if you're pedaling a regular bike and then an e-bike comes up next to you and <laughs> zooms past the hill, like you feel bad. About Does it make it. any sound? Not, not really. Not a, a whine or anything. Not really, no. So they really wouldn't know. They just think you're just superwoman. Yeah, and I mean, right, and because I am essentially. So yeah, you can hear it. it's not making yeah. much sound. So e-bikes are huge. They're one of the biggest growing transportation markets, especially in China and other places. Like in the cities, they're big for food delivery. People use these a lot because you can get to where you're going faster. And they're actually kind of controversial. In New York, a lot of people are trying to make them illegal. What? Because, you know, it's that kind of, it's a, it's a lot of people of color that are riding them, that are doing it for their jobs. They're, they're, so um, let's delivering. make them illegal? Yeah, so people are like, oh, those crazy people. Oh, because those they say nuts. They're, they say they're, they're unsafe. Safe. They go too fast. They're not unsafe, but, please. Um, you but can yeah. pedal a regular bike 20 miles an hour. Yeah. There's not really a place for them. Like, do they fit in the, you know, bike? They're bike? bicycles. They fit in They're the, bicycles. Yeah. Call them bicycles. If you want a bike for just exercise, like I would say, um, you know, if you're going, like if you want to get to like like a hike, you know, something you take. They're for commuting. They're for getting around town. They're not for exercise. Not really. I mean, because they're a little heavy. Forty-seven pounds. Yeah, they're. Uh, yes, they're they're lighter for an e-bike, but they're heavier, much heavier than a regular bike. Yeah. Now, say. could you ride it in the rain? Or yeah, I did ride it a little bit in the rain, and it was fine. So I mean, they don't recommend that you just get soaked. But yeah, if you're deciding whether or not to ride because it's raining to work, they would recommend. Yeah. See, I'm riding it on wet roads there. Now, I notice it has, uh, a, the hub is a little bit different. Those are disc brakes, I think, in there, mm -hmm. right? They are disc brakes. They, they worked great, even yeah. when it was wet. Uh, you want me to show you how it works here? Can you ride it? Well, no, I meant just oh. the screen. <laughs> yes. Let's. I'm wearing a dress. I'm not wearing my biking clothes. Um, so, yeah, you just turn it on, and here's the little screen here. So you have a little here. screen on the handlebars. And it's on one, and if you, so that's just a pretty slow. You can even have it to, to zero, and then just ride it like a regular bike. Um, but you can go all the way up to five. And now, then if I have it on fast. five, does it always go five miles an hour, or, or that's, No, that's there... not five miles an hour. Um, it's five is the highest. Five is like, okay. Yeah, that's as fast as that's how the only way you could get it up to 35 miles an hour I, if you tried, <laughs> and probably you had to be going downhill. downhill. Yeah, yeah. Um, you, and there are gears here too, like this regular gears that you can adjust, um, just like you adjust a regular. So bike. when does it kick in? How do you make it kick in? Uh, you can turn it up and pedal, or you can just press this, and then it just. Whoa! <laughs> so, <laughs> so it works. <laughs> Nice. That's good. We almost lost Megan. Well, that's one See, thing about really electric works. motors. They have a lot of torque. You probably don't want to start it from scratch. You'd probably like and to be going probably a not bit. inside yeah, either. Definitely um, not that. It has a light. It has a bell. LED lights. And it has a bell, bell yeah. uh, and a light for outside if you wanted to ride at night. You now, here's the big light. question. How long are you going to get to ride this? What, how In between charges, how, how long do you go? Uh, we rode it, uh, between me and my boys who rode it, we rode it about four hours. Wow. Like, I rode it on a, um, just straight for about an hour and a half. Because that's going to vary depending on how much assist you use. Yeah. 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 So, um, I, I really, for environmental reasons, if you are on the fence about riding a bike to work, um, I, I did idea. some research, and it's, I think that, this, that riding a bike to work, commuting by Hi, bike Edward. to work. <laughs> you do hear a little, I hear a little riding. electric one. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was, I was going What did Edward that. think? I know what hill, that hill is murder. Yeah, at Helen Putnam that's Park. That's Helen Putnam. That hill he is, that, you can't really get a sense from that shot, but that's, uh, that's probably a 25 degree hill. That's a very steep hill. Yeah, it is. Um, wow. I can barely walk up that hill. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Lisa goes powering up that hill. I go, wait, I'm out here at the bottom. Slow down. Oh, there she is. Hi, Lisa. Uh, wow, that's really uh, that's yeah. really nice. So, I like that. Um, uh, if you are looking, if you are on the fence about commuting, I say try it. It's uh, commuting, but an electric bike has the same Eastbound. environmental impact as public transportation. Well, and so. I've been looking at them, and, and at three or four thousand dollars, it doesn't it doesn't seem like something I want to kind of. It's too much of a luxury, but this is a little bit closer to my price range. Still a little yeah. pricey, but still. Don't you have an electric bike? I have a Segway. Oh, you have the Segway. Uh, this would be a little more practical. If yeah. you think people laugh at you on an electric bike, wait till you ride around in yeah, a Segway. Yeah, nobody laughed at me on the bike. I just don't think they really knew. But they I mean, didn't I think realize, in, yeah. in cities, so yeah, here's the battery, and you just it comes with a key, and then you lock it and take it out, and then it goes back in, and it's it's pretty easy to get okay. back in. Okay, New York, do not ban electric bikes. They're good. They're good for you. Yeah, I was interested doing research, like how it's sort of a culture. It's a cultural fight in some big cities. Um, mm -hmm. You know, one of those weird kind of yeah. get off my lawn. Electric San Francisco, bikes. we get a lot of bike couriers. You know, that's the you know, a city like New York or San Francisco. The only way you can really, you know, in a timely fashion mm -hmm. get around. Right.
That's great. And I think it's like that they're going to deliver food in, in different neighborhoods. Motorists they don't like it because they don't want they don't want to see all these people on bicycles in right. their lane. Exactly. I they don't, don't want to get hurt. Yeah. But you know, for also if you worry, um, I don't know if we have any video, but it's always hard for me to accelerate like from a light or a stop sign. This so does, this, this does that really well. Cause that because like I'm tempted to when I'm riding my bike, sometimes I'll just like roll through a stop sign so I don't have to yeah, stop. You don't want to stop. Because but right. this you don't feel bad stopping because you just go zoop. Not necessarily faster, but just it's easier. Like yeah. if you have that fear yeah. when you're riding a bike in traffic of like, what's going to happen? Nice. Yeah. I love it. You have parody. Yes. Eastspin. Eastspin.com. And thank you for letting us borrow the Yeah, Eastspin. that's pretty I'm cool. sad to give it back, but we will. Our show today, brought, we're going to get cooking in a second, uh, but our show today, first before we do that, brought to you by the Ring Video Doorbell, yet another Internet of Things device. There seems to be something going on here. I have a Ring Video Doorbell. It's one of those 37 devices uh, connected to my network. I love it because I can, when I'm anywhere, when I'm at work, when I'm at home, Yes, I actually answer the doorbell when I'm at home sometimes. I don't want to get up. I don't want to go get the door. I could see who's there. I could say, we're not here. Go away. I could say, I can't come to the door right now. I'm in my jammies. Please leave the package. But also you could see intruders. I just love it. It's a, it's a high-def camera, microphone, speaker, and motion sensor all rolled into a doorbell that replaces your existing wired doorbell. Or there's a battery version that doesn't even need wires and lasts a whole year. The Ring Video Doorbell. We've told you about this for a long time. Now... Ring has expanded their line. This is the Ring uh, floodlight cam. So you've seen floodlights before that light up, motion sensitive floodlights. You go down behind your house and the lights come on. That's a convenience. These are especially nice. They're LED lights. But it's also got the Ring camera, microphone, speaker attached. And one more thing you don't have on the doorbell, a 110 decibel alarm and this light. So if you get a notice, you're at work, somebody's behind your house, maybe you're traveling, you're on vacation, you, somebody's behind your house. You could turn on the camera, see who it is. You could speak with them. They can speak with you. And if they don't get out of your backyard, you could fire off that 110 decibel alarm and they go running. These are great. I want to surround my house with a ring of security. And now you can and save up to $150 at ring.com slash NSS. Take a look at the ring of security kits. They include a ring doorbell, either the original or the pro, plus one, two, or three Ring floodlight cams. Best of CES for 2017, according to the Wall Street Journal. I'd agree. Ring.com slash NSS. Save up to $150. With Ring, you're always home. Love our Ring. All right, let's go, uh, let's go do some uh, cooking. What do you say? I like it. Let me just turn off my bike light. <coughs> Actually, to give us time to move over there, because it's a long walk. You could ride your bike. Okay, I tried to. <laughs> We're going to check in with Jason Howell for his review of the Google Home Mini and the Zolo Mojo smart speakers. I like saying that. Zolo Mojo. The Home Assistant Wars are heating up, especially now that the major players are opening up the platforms for third-party hardware makers to get involved. Google recently did this with its own Assistant API, meaning that third-party Google Home likes are starting to roll in. Competition means more choice, and that's a great thing. So let's compare the new Google Home Mini to Anchor's newly released Zolo Mojo. Though they're similar in many ways, they have a few key differences. First, the Google Home Mini, which might be immediately appealing considering it comes from Google itself. It's a small, tight package surrounding cloth that makes it blend into the room just a little bit more than the other one. The shallow hockey puck design means that there's less room inside for a booming speaker, and that is instantly noticeable when playing certain types of music through the device. Now I'm not trying to be rude, but hey, pretty girl, I'm feeling you the way you do. The sound seems to compress a little bit at loud volumes, especially when you're playing bass heavy music. Not very ideal. The far field microphones are incredibly capable though. I was able to fire off commands to the mini that's installed in my downstairs kitchen from upstairs in my bedroom with minimal yelling. Even I was impressed by that. Volume adjustments on the device are easy. You just tap on the left or the right side of the puck, though tap to fire, which used to be a feature when you tapped on top of the device, has been permanently disabled due to some manufacturing issues that resulted in phantom taps in the pre-release phase. And you can mute the microphone with the button here, and you know it's muted thanks to the bar of orange LEDs on top. Finally, you can connect to the Google Home Mini via Bluetooth, and it becomes an easy speaker in any room. And then we have Anchor's new Zolo Mojo device with a small form factor that makes it easy to compare against the Google Home Mini. By comparison, though, the Mojo has much more of a traditional technology design to it. 
It's a bit taller and encased in black plastic, and that means it's going to stand out just a little bit more depending on the shelf or the room that you plug it into. Because the Mojo is taller, though, it makes room for a base port inside the design that actually does improve the quality of sound when compared to the Google Home Mini. Now you turn the Mojo up all the way and your music's still going to sound pretty darn pristine considering and you get an extra hint of low end to boot. But again, the design is rather small so don't expect rich luxurious sound from the Mojo in the end. The onboard Farfield microphones for voice commands are fine if you happen to be in the room with the Mojo. I'd say less ideal if you're outside of the room, at least from my experience. And the top of the Mojo is actually a touchpad, which means you have to swipe right to turn the volume up, swipe left to turn that volume down. And this action I did find to be a little iffy at times. Sometimes it didn't quite register fast enough to make the required changes. But tap to fire on the top does work with the Mojo, in fact, and it'll pause your music if it happens to be playing. That's a feature that I use all the time. This button mutes the mic, and again, the you'll see some muted. red LEDs on top to let you know that it's safely muted. And yes, Bluetooth capabilities baked in that make this a Bluetooth speaker as well. Both devices work identically with all the fancy features that Google's Assistant affords. It can be synced up with other home devices for multi-room audio, and both devices are going to run you around $50, so it's really a question of your priorities. If music is your priority, I'd give the edge to the Zolo Mojo, uh, but I much prefer the look of the Google Home Mini. Both are incredibly and almost equally capable though, so you really can't go wrong. I'm Jason Howell, and you can catch me on All About Android and Tech News Weekly, and all over the Twit Network at twit.tv. It's time for the gift guide for food. Hey, guess what? Potatoes are done. Isn't that cool? Can you hear that? I can hear it. That's the magic sound that the June oven makes when potatoes are done. You know, I brought everything except I forgot one thing. Your muffs for yeah. your hands? Yeah, I forgot pot holders. But look how nice those look. And that, I did not uh, do anything but say, these are potatoes. Cook them however you would for roasted potatoes. They've got a nice crust. They're delicious. That's the June oven. And I was able to watch that. I can, in fact, if you want, I'll show you the, re, the instant replay of those potatoes cooking. They came out just great. Uh, another alarm, by the way. Uh, it looks like our eggs are done in our mellow cooker. So let's talk a little bit about this. First, I'll start with the June oven, $1,400. It's an internet connected oven that's actually running Android. And in fact, if you look at the control screen on the front, it actually looks, it's about the size and shape of an Android phone. And it has a couple of interesting features. Uh, in fact, let me come back over here and show you. For one thing, uh, if, if you put something in, as I did with the potatoes, you can tell that it, it has a camera and it will say, that looks like it actually said potatoes or Brussels sprouts. You pick it and then it will just cook it. But it also has built in presets for a variety of foods, vegetables, seafood, poultry, meat, frozen foods, baked goods, toast, nuts, all kinds of baked goods. So you, you can go by that as well. The camera's usually pretty accurate, but it's nice to be able to take the presets. It'll even, oh, our echo just woke up. It'll even just work as a regular toaster oven where you could toast, broil, bake. It's a convection oven and has a fan. And these are special uh, heating coils. Hello. Hello. <laughs> These are ceramic heating coils. And one of the nice things about ceramic heating coils, they preheat very quickly, they come to temperature very fast, and they cook very evenly. So I'm really, uh, I, it's, I know it's an expensive toaster oven, but I kind of love how well it cooks. Uh, let's see, what else can I show you? Um, you can do slow cooking, you can do roasting and baking. I can go through this menu, broiling, toasting. It does a great job of reheating pizza. You could put it on reheat. There's a keep warm. There's even a scale. Now this is kind of wild. So uh, this, the way that it knows what's in here is it, uh, it um, has a camera and it has feet. It knows how much your meat weighs. It knows how much your potatoes weigh. It has special weighing feet. And so I've turned it into scale mode. You see, it's already zeroed out even though the potatoes are on top of there. If I put the salt on there, it's gonna tell me Oh yeah, that is uh, six ounces. Is that wild? So it's good if you're like counting calories and like oh, you I can use it as a food scale. Yeah, I mean, I I don't know if I would, but you could, you could use it as a food scale. It, you'll see the Android heritage when you go into settings. Uh, it has a, a a lot of kind of Android style settings. It has a clock. You pair it to your Wi-Fi. You pair it to your phone. You can do seat cooking, set cooking uh, from away from home 
on the Wi-Fi. I really, as, as, as expensive as it is for fourteen hundred bucks, I, I really think it's a, a nice oven. Let's just put a little salt on here. Does it? That'll if your Wi-Fi, if your Wi-Fi is not working, does you can it still use it. Absolutely, you just you, you just uh, everything works. You just don't get the the connectivity. Now, here's something else I really like that's a little weird. It's a little expensive. This is a sous vide cooker called Mello. I've got two sous vides here. In fact, for most of the time, I use the Anova. It's inexpensive. It's about $130. What, a, what sous vide is, it's French for under vacuum. And what you're doing is you're slow cooking, very slow cooking foods in a water bath. So the fundamental item in a sous vide cooker is a recirculating pump that has a very accurate temperature sensor. These are common in labs. In fact, that's, I think, probably how it started was some chemist somewhere said, you know, I could probably use this recirculating heater and uh, cook my fish. But then chefs started using it in restaurants. If you think about a restaurant where you have to have a hundred different cuts of meat, some medium, some well done, you have to have fish, you have to have, if you sous vide them ahead of time, they're fully cooked. They're fully cooked. This one is a, a salmon that's been sous vide exactly 115 degrees. That's very low temperature. It's not boiling. It's not even really that hot. I could stick my hand in here. But if it's time plus temperature, that means it's fully cooked. And actually, the temperature is going down now because I've stopped it because we're going to take it out in a second. Uh, and, and it's ready to eat. This is uh, the Mello, which does something even more special. And I'll show you the Mello software on here. What Mello also has a scale in it. Uh, this is a plain old water bath. When you put something in the mellow, the scale senses there's weight and says, oh, I see you've put something in. What would you like to cook today? Let's say I wanted to cook uh, something in the pork family, baby back rigs, pork belly, pork cheeks. I like to do pork chops. And what you do is you say how big they are. These are half inch cut. Uh, and then you say uh, what, how well you want it to cook, rare, medium rare, you don't have to really know anything about temperatures and times. You say, cook, it's going to say, when do you want it done? When you tell it when, it, uh, yeah, right now it's not going to because I just finished the eggs. When you want it done. And what happens, so I'll give you an example. And this is one of the problems with sous vide. You have to be around to start it. And an hour or two later, you have to be around to cook it. Most people, you get home at 5 o'clock, you want to eat at 6. There's not enough time to sous vide. You can't so, do it from home? I mean, from like work, from an app? You can with the mellow. So here's oh. what happens. Uh, in, the, in the morning, or actually the night, I say, I want soft-boiled eggs when I get up at 7. Now, I'm not going to get up at 5.30 so that I'll have eggs at 7. So what I do is I put the eggs in here. It says, oh, you want to make some eggs? What kind of eggs do you want to make? How do you want to make them? Creamy, velvety? What kind of yolks do you want? You tell it. And then it says, what time do you want to eat? And I say, 7 a.m. You put the eggs in. It's going to keep them cool. This mellow is different from the ANOVA. The mellow cools and heats. So it's going to keep them cool. It keeps them down at 48 degrees, just like in your refrigerator, until an hour and a half or whatever the cooking time is before, and then turns on and starts cooking. That is remarkable because it means you can put your steak in when you go to work, ignore it. You can check it, of course, from work. And if you decide to delay it, you can even do that via the Wi-Fi at work. But it'll be ready when you get home. So let me get these soft-boiled eggs out of here. because I think cooking you're cooking vegetables in there. Did well, you, see that? you could cook anything in here that you, you, you could sous vide, and that, of course, includes vegetables and meats. Normally, you're going to put them in little bags, and that's what we did with the, uh, with the salmon. I'll show you that in a second. So these are done, and actually, they were done a few minutes ago, but this will keep it uh, kind of cooking, and it gave me an alert. I, one of the things I love about all of these devices is they let you know what's going on. So the Mellow actually gave me an alert and said, your food is done. Would you like to get it out? And then it, was, it says, last time we made soft poached eggs, how good were those? So it'll ask you to rate them. Uh -huh. And I'm not sure why, but I, my, my guess is it's, it's slightly amending its recipes depending on your reactions. So that's, that's kind of cool. So let's take these out and see. I chose... Uh, uh, the reason they call them poached is the whites are kind of runny and the, the yolk is very creamy. Really, sous vide eggs is one of the great things in the world to do. So I'm going to take this egg out. This temperature was only, I think, 100, I think it was 135 degrees. Now, I brought with me, I brought my childhood soft-boiled oh, egg cup. Uh, cup. Oh, adorable. Isn't that adorable? I grew up my whole life eating soft-boiled eggs on this cup. Let's just see. Did it ever bother you that the chicken was upside down? When you it's only chicken? upside down until you serve it upside down. You do this, and then you turn it over. 
Oh, now you could eat it out, and a lot of people do. In, in Britain, I've seen them do it, eating it out of the egg. But what I like to do is I like to get it out of the egg and put a little toast in there. Mm -hmm. um, but now, what's interesting is the yolk is is uh, creamy and custardy, and the white is a little bit runny. But I think it's going to be. I'm just going to scoop it out here. It's going to be the best tasting soft boiled egg you've ever had in your life. And it, would you like a little salt and oh, pepper yeah, in there? Oh yeah, a little salt, a little salt. Oh, ooh, it's so velvety, just as promised. Isn't it? Isn't it? You see inside there? It's kind of good. A little salt, a little pepper, and just let you let you taste that. So I actually do this a lot for ooh. breakfast. It seems like a kind of a trivial use of a sous vide device. Okay. These are perfectly food safe. Now some people are going to say, well, if you don't get meat to 165 degrees or the egg to 160, you're not killing the bacteria, but you are because it's not merely temperature, it's time. So because these are long cooking, this cooked for a minute, an hour and 20 minutes at 100, I can't remember, 130 degrees, uh, it's definitely food safe to eat it. So those are the eggs. Uh, let's take the salmon out. Now, I'll, I will show you there's one problem. There's one big problem with sous vide -ing. Uh, it's fine for eggs, but when you're cooking meat or fish, there's no finish to it. Now, this salmon is perfectly cooked. You could eat it as it is. It's food safe, but you're going to see it looks kind of, well, underdone, right? It doesn't look pretty. It's not pretty. And that's because normal cooking methods uh, also heat the outside. They, they kind of roast them a little bit. Mm -hmm. So we have ways to roast it. Now, I say at home, I didn't uh, bring this in because it's a full-size uh, grill. At home, I have a gas grill called a Solaire, and I love the Solaire. The Solaire is a big version of what I'm about to show you, which is called a Sears All. Ooh. So the Solaire is a gas grill, but instead of having the flames cook the meat or the fish, it actually heats ceramic elements, which get red, red hot, up to 1,000 degrees. It sears it very quickly. And frankly, that's what you really want. Uh, <laughs> she's stepping back. I don't Should know. Should we I have don't... safety goggles? No, what the heck? Uh, if I can remember how to use this, uh, I don't think we have any problem. <laughs> so I should show you, uh, this is actually just the kind of plumber's uh, brazing torch, but it has a special attachment. That's the Searsall. And you see it has a metal screen. When I light the torch, you see that? The screen is going to get red hot. Ah. And that's also how the Solaire grill works uh, as well. Um, it gets red hot, and then we can use it to very quickly, in effect, broil the fish. So I'm actually going to finish this. You could do this on a grill. You could do this with the Solaire, which is my preferred way to do it. Again, we're not cooking the fish here. We're just cooking the outside of the fish to give it a nice burnished kind of feel. And you could see this is, this is quite hot. This is uh, infrared heat that is now cooking it. And I would also do the backside of it. But it doesn't take very long. The Solaire is nice because you could do, of course, many patties or multiple steaks. And it still works as a regular grill to cook burgers and things like that. The Solaire's range in price from tabletop Solaire's for just a few hundred bucks to the big cookout grill for up to $3,000. Uh, this Sears All is only about $75. And you can buy it and just one of those standard torch burnishing uh, tools. You see how nicely uh, mm -hmm. uh, roasted that's getting? It actually gives it a very nice finish. Now, if, if we weren't on TV right now, I'd probably do the other side because, of course, the skin you want oh, nice yeah. and crisp and so forth. But you can see how easy that is right. to do. Now you can put it on Instagram. Now it's Instagram. Now it's Instagram ready. Okay. All right. So there you go. The Mellow. Uh, I think you can buy this right now at cookmellow.com for, is it $3.99? I believe it's $3.99. Uh, you'll save a lot of money if you go with okay. Anova. This is the Wi-Fi. There's the Mellow. Uh, the Wi-Fi Anova has both Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, and uh, the Wi-Fi one will let you do it from home or check it from home, and that's a little under $150. That's it's a better deal. The, yeah, the Wi-Fi one is, it says $200. $200, okay. And the Bluetooth See, I didn't even, is $150. Yeah, yeah, and I got the Bluetooth uh, on a Black Friday deal oh. for 100 bucks. So uh, actually it was Prime Day. And by the way, I should point out this great book. We interviewed, and we've, we've actually done sous vide on the show before, you may remember, with Kenji Lopez-Alt. This is his book, The Food Lab. A great gift if you've got somebody in the family who's a cook. Lots of great pictures, lots of information about sous vide, but also the science of cooking. Kenji is an amazing guy. And if you didn't see our sous vide segment that we went and shot at his house uh, last year, 
you might want to check that out. And this is another sous vide cookbook that actually the Mellow folks sent me, which I thought was pretty nice. Uh, I use my Mellow all the time, and I think it seems silly just soft boiling eggs, but there's lots of things you can do with it. And man, that's going to be the best salmon you've ever had, those roast potatoes. We're done. I'm done with my side of the cooking show. Okay, well, um, oh, you know what? We didn't we didn't try the meter. Did you, Should we see how hot it is inside oh, there? Oh, well, that's, it's cooled okay. off a little bit. All right, well, okay. I'll tell you what. Before we do that, let's flip it over. Okay. Do you mind... Poking and, it, and probing uh, it. I want to. I want to just cook the skin. See okay. that you don't want to serve that, do you? No. That doesn't look good. But oh boy, it tastes good. Holy cow, that tastes really good. I'm just going to uh, just going to braise this a little bit. We'll be back after this word. <laughs> okay. So can I poke? Can I use my thermometer? In Go here? ahead. Okay. So, so this is what uh, electric uh, Bluetooth thermometer. Bluetooth. It's got a great name. The meter. M e a t. I'm stick it in there. E r. There you go. That's and a then, medium um, rare salmon steak. I want to see what it, it's telling me. It's, oh, it's going go. up 100, 100, 101. So we could have set it up and, and decided what, you know, to 102. Set it's going up a little bit. Fish. It's cooled off a little bit. That's about right. It's mm -hmm. cooled off a little bit. Yeah, so we used this last night with the roast. I use uh, InstaRead thermometers all the time. You want to use that. Right. All right I'm sorry I made, made a hole in your salmon. That's all right. You're going to see all that delicious, buttery <laughs> salmon flavor. So you could just stick that in anything and yeah. see what uh, temperature stick is. Stick it in you. <laughs> <laughs> I won't. All right, um, I won't. I won't do any more uh, searsing. Okay, there you go. So now, ready what's for next? Some beverages. Yes, Should I'm ready to drink. Should we go first or down? Coffee or beer? Which do you want to do uh, first? Let's do the travel mug because I could use some coffee. Right okay, now. this is from Ember. This is really, if you love coffee. Um, this is what you need or what anyone uh, on your gift list who I, loves coffee. This I is, have, you have the travel mug, okay. but I have the ceramic mug. Right so yeah, this, if you hate cold coffee as much as I do, then you need this because this will keep your coffee at whatever temperature you want it to keep. And you can see um, it's at 133 degrees. Oh, that's cool. What I like it, the way I like it. But they, what's interesting is, uh, so both of these have plates that you charge them with, yes. they little pogo pins that charge the mug, but then the mug itself has the heater. Right. So you don't have to keep it on the saucer no, to keep things warm. No, you take it to warm. work. It has a two-hour battery. So you Mine can bring that in the has, car, which is Yes, great. and yeah. then I have. since, And then you just drink it, and it's still... Mm. Mm. Ah, that's delicious. If your favorite temperature is 120 degrees, if your temp favorite temperature is 180 degrees, because what I hate also is drinking scalding coffee. And, like, you put it into the travel mug, you're driving the kids to school, and only you take a sip, and it's like, ah, it's too hot. So now I would know... This doesn't cool it. Well, yeah, it will cool it depending on what your temperature okay. is. Okay. Um, the Ember and uh, the Ember travel mug, as you said, 150 bucks. The ceramic mug that I have, one of the Time Magazine best inventions of uh, 2017. Yeah, and that's nice. ceramic. And if you really this is like a real coffee mug, which I kind of like. And this is like a real travel coffee mug. But if you want to spend even more, if you already know someone with an Ember and they're on your gift list, you can buy a ceramic top for this. We uh, I used this uh, on Saturday, and it did keep my coffee warm. I had a little trouble pairing it. I don't know what was going on. Oh, so I had no trouble. It worked all right for you? Yeah, Bluetooth I mean, we is should, always a little weird, right? We should take a look at the app because it's a really nicely designed app. And when it reaches the temperature, it will notify you on your Apple Watch. Your nice. coffee is the Very nice. right temperature. So I have it at 133. I could make it higher or lower. And yeah, pairing it was, it also has lots of firmware. I updates. should mention that the Mellow and the June will also work with your Apple Watch to let you know your cooking is done. You can also name your, mine was called Liquid Joy, but now I'm going to just call <laughs> you it Leo. named your mug. You know, coffee's nice, but every once in a while I'd prefer a beer. You would? Do okay. you have anything for me? I do. Okay, so this is physics. The way tap. This was my uh, physics with an F. Physics. Fizz. I love So this claims that it can create the experience of draft beer. You put a bottle or a can in there, right? Mm -hmm. And then it feels like it's tapped using ultrasound, which sounds, I hate to say it, but what that sounds like to me is they agitate the beer with sound so it's fizzy. Okay. Is that what we're getting here? Uh, Let's yeah. try well, you it. Like, you like, do you like tap beer? I like tap beer. beer. Tap beer. You don't uh, like it better than the I'm not sure why I like beer on the tap. Test. I usually think it's fresher. Okay. Is that why we like beer okay, so. on tap? Here's one straight from the bottle. So this isn't going to make it any fresher. Shh. Yeah. And then I open this up. Yeah. The physics. You put that in the... Uh, oh, you don't even pour it in. You just put, put it bottle. right on top. Let me come around and and, uh, and uh, pour myself a yeah. frothy okay. beverage. Should right. I just pour it or do I have to push a button? You, or? You, no, you just like a tap. Oh, other way. Oh, no, I guess. <laughs> oh. Yeah, that's oh, the head. That's, that's head. the head. That gives you head, and mm -hmm. this gives you beer. Mm -hmm. God, it's everything you need in life. Um, 
Okay. <laughs> I so don't know. it made a lot of fizz. Yeah. Uh, here, let me try to do it. Anthony gave me directions. Now, I, th I think the idea here is, I've had and I've heard this, with this a lot more than you have. Clearly. That uh, the the head, you want a little head oh, because that it. gives you f the aromatics and the flavor. Okay, well, you're gonna. Okay. <laughs> I have a little bit more <laughs> taste froth than this. Let's taste this. Oh, it's okay. I cannot pull a beer. Somebody said, okay. You don't get that beer mustache with the other yeah. one. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it's definitely better. It's frothing it up. It's not chilling it. It's not doing anything but frothing it up using ultrasound. The Physic mm -hmm. Way Tap, and that's uh, if you if you like frothy beer, you could just shake it up. But <laughs> if you like frothy beer, I don't think so. You could just light that salmon actually, on fire you know, too. Yeah, you you could. <laughs> no, actually, I have to say it does taste more like on uh, beer on tap. On do you, tap do you, yeah. and, Anthony, you use this? You just used mm -hmm. it the other day. All right. So it's not like something from your home. Because it seems like you would like this. It Anthony is, is a connoisseur I mean, of fine beers. Let's just say, Leo, all of these items, like when you have people over, you're going to impress them. With like, my meter probe, my <laughs> physics weigh tap, your my ember travel torch. mug, my June oven, my Solaire radiant grill, my Sears on torch attachment, my A Nova precision cooker, and my mellow sous vide. Mm -hmm. All of these can tie up the Wi Fi in your house. <laughs> Wow. Actually, I have to say, I wish the Mellow weren't so expensive, but I love this. I use this all the time. And I use our Innova all the time. And if you, if you just want to try sous vide, that's what I'd recommend. Mm -hmm. But if you're ready to graduate, and by the way, it's okay to have two. Because you notice we had multiple dishes. You may want to do multiple sous vides. Did you really like that soft boiled egg or were you just pretending? Oh, no, I really liked it. Let me take the meter out of it. Um, I really enjoyed it, but I didn't want to, like, it's rude to eat on camera. I feel like you always invite me for the food shows. Why is that? Because um, I know you like to eat. I do. You mm -hmm. like, we like to mm -hmm. eat together. Mm -hmm. uh, earlier uh, this year, we talked to a guy from a company called Efficient Power Conversion. His name was Alex Lido. And he sold me on a new technology, a semiconductor technology called gallium nitride. Watch. Have you ever heard of gallium nitride? Well, you're going to. Joining me right now, Alex Lido. He is the CEO and uh, co uh, founder of a company called Efficient Power Conversion. But you're an expert in uh, silicon chip design, I gather. Uh, your PhD was in something called gallium arsenide. I remember we heard a lot about gallium arsenide a few years ago. What is gallium arsenide? Well, it's a, it's a semiconductor like silicon, okay. uh, except it was uh, really too expensive and too difficult to uh, manufacture so to be broadly adopted. At the time, the thought was we'll use gallium arsenide instead of silicon. And what would the advantage be? Speed. It's faster. Yeah. Faster, like the electrons move faster? Yeah, the on electrons a, on a move much faster wow. in, in okay. gallium arsenide. So arsenide was a, pr a problem. We've replaced it with nitride? Gallium nitride, which has that same property of being much faster than silicon, yeah. but it can be less expensive than silicon by a lot. Interesting. So we're now actually making uh, gallium nitride ICs, integrated circuits, and field effect transistors, FETs. Correct. Uh, and those are analog devices. Yes, power and analog, yes. Okay. And that's what you guys do. Yeah. Eventually, could they be also used? Could you have a, a gallium nitride uh, Intel processor? Yes, you could. So eventually, it could be used for digital as eventually, well. Eventually, yes. There are some technical hurdles, but I have confidence in the genius of technology. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So what uh, Alex has brought us is a number of devices that, it, and some of them you don't have yet, but may have in the future. Is gallium nitride in use anywhere right now? Sure. Uh, it's in use uh, in uh, base stations. It's in use in uh, base stations for uh, for like 4G LTE trans, uh, oh, transmission. Oh, cell tower base stations. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, and it's uh, it's also in use in any of those autonomous cars that you see. They Every all have one gallium, gallium nitride. We'll nitride, actually yeah. show you the part. Well, you see it rotating over here. That's right. in the car. Actually, we should talk about this. This is this is from uh, Velodyne. They're the biggest manufacturers of something called lidar, which is light detection and ranging and uh, the all, you see these on top of uh, you know the self-driving Google cars the self-driving uh, cars from Apple these little rotating things those are lidars and they're imaging the world around them 
right? That's right. The, 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 you can see the image right here. Oh, this is what's actually yeah. coming out of that. It's coming out this of This LiDAR? Yeah, and you can see us waving oh if my you look God. closely. But, In uh, real time. Yeah, so that's what... You are. So and we've seen images like this when you when they show the image that the uh, a Tesla sees, for instance, it looks no, like no. The Tesla is the one that doesn't doesn't see have that. lidar. Okay, <laughs> but all the Google cars do, and yeah. all everybody else's do. Yeah. So this, uh, and why is gallium nitride so important for a, a lidar device? So in lidar, gallium nitride is a thousand times faster than silicon, and that allows you to get a thousand times more accurate picture, a thousand times faster. So if this were, if they were using a, a, a silicon processor or a silicon chip in this lidar, you'd get a lower res image, and it would be too slow. Right. The car, the car would run into things before it noticed them. <laughs> exactly. You were telling me that <laughs> in the original uh, challenge, the original DARPA challenge, uh, Velodyne had the, a lidar that was not powered by gallium nitride. It was a lot slower. Yes. And you remember in those early days of the uh, of the uh, challenge, these cars would drive off the road and like they go <laughs> ten feet and they go. Arr! or they'd hit a rock, but now they're very, very effective. It's amazing. So this actually was, gallium nitride was probably the single most important development in self-driving cars. Well, I wouldn't call it the single most important, but I think it is a critical element. It in, made in LiDAR creating, more workable. Yeah, yeah. Right, makes, it, makes LiDAR a very, very efficient way to see. So I, I, I and, and by the way, we're gonna do a triangulation, so we'll get a lot, a lot more detail about how this works, because it, it's really fascinating. But gallium nitride, you said, is faster for power. What does that mean, faster? And why is that important for something like LiDAR? So uh, it turns on and off much faster. It but, switches faster. But a lot of power. So if you look at your microprocessor, you've got transistors switching very fast, but they're switching just a few electrons. Right. We're switching a lot of power. Actual, you know, juice, yeah, like... Uh, 50, 60 amperes of power into these lasers. Just as fast, though, as a processor would switch. Yep, and that's the key, Holy is you've got to be able to do that in a couple of nanoseconds. Holy cow. And you've got to pump out those photons so that they can get out there and come back, and it detects the speed of light. It, that's what it uh, uses to measure range. So again, I would submit that without gallium nitride, LiDAR would not be nearly as useful, and without fast high-resolution LiDAR, right. you really wouldn't want to get in one of these self-driving cars. Right. Let's move back over here because there's another use that I think is also very interesting. Um, this, this is wireless power. It can be used in wireless power. Now, why is it uh, valuable in wireless power? So wireless power uh, uh, needs higher frequencies so that they don't uh, interfere with things around us. So there are a couple of of uh, unregulated bands, one at 6.78 megahertz, another at 13.56, and on and on and on up. Yeah. Uh, and These you are bands the FCC says you can do what you do. What you want. For research purposes. And, so yeah. we can use it to transmit power. Well, okay, wait a minute, slow down. So when I use, uh, when I think of wireless power, I think of my smartphone, I put it, uh, I have a little cradle because it has to be positioned carefully on the, on the inductive charger. That's inductive charging, it's sitting on there. Yeah. Uh, what's happening is, is, is the charger is basically stimulating electrons in the phone uh, to give it power. Yeah, if, that, you, if you put two coils next to each other and run current through one, it'll, it'll it, create current in the sympathy other. Sympathy gets sympathy current in exactly. the second coil. That's so that's what's happening on my toothbrush, on my phone. Right. That's not what we're talking about here. No. You're no. actually broadcasting power. So there are two ways in front of us. One is electromagnetic broadcasting power, like yeah. uh, a very powerful radio signal. You wouldn't want to stand on a radio tower at 100,000 watts. It would actually burn you because yeah. there's so much energy yes. coming off of it. Right. Uh, okay. But you can use that uh, outdoors. At low, yeah, outdoors, at, outdoors. Or at a lower wattage. Or at a lower right. power. Yeah. Right. So what? So this is a... So this is, this is a, a mid-air refueling system for a drone. So a drone comes along if it were flying, and when it comes near this antenna, it actually gets refueled. Okay, wait a minute. This is wild. So this, 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 what looks like a circuit board, this green board, is a transmitter of power, enough yes. power to drive the drone. But this is only a few inches. How far could it transfer? Well, it, it depends on the design of the antennas. If you design the antennas to be a long distance, it could be a long distance. But so in other words, a drone could be flying somewhere and hover over one of these antennas charge up its battery and continue on. That's what it was designed for, because you know it's hard to land a drone outdoors. If it's right. windy, 
Right. You lose control of the of the drone. So this, where's the gallium arsenide in this? Gallium nitrides. These Nitride. two little tiny blue dots there powering this thing. Oh, you can't even say them. But that's in effect a step down transformer in there, or what is? It's going actually on? An, uh, an amplifier that amplifies. It's an amplifier. Yeah, it amplifies a signal at 13.5 megahertz that's received in the uh, in the uh, drone. Now, presumably, I could use any amplifier to do that, right? What? But gallium nitride is what smaller. Uh, it's it's hard to do uh, an amplifier for power at 13.56 megahertz efficiently. Got it. If you do it in other materials like silicon, it's very very inefficient. Got it. And we want to make these things efficient because these antennas transmitting to drones should be uh, connected to a little solar panel right. with a battery pack, right. and then you throw them on tops of buildings and you get your pizza delivered. Now you don't you wouldn't want this in the home because it's uh, you don't want to transmit power through the air really electromagnetically right but magnetically is okay because we don't absorb magnetism so this is a charger that this is a new laptop from Dell that charges on a magnetic charger a magnetic resonance and uh, so like MRI like ma exactly like MRI, by the way, except much a million times less magnetic field. Okay, so we know MRIs are harm relatively harmless. This would be much a million, a millionth is harmless. Million. So this harmful. laptop, I I don't know if you can see it. There's no, there's no uh, power cord on this thing. It it comes on when I put it on this pad. It's getting its power from the pad, but this is not inductance. Right. This is it, so. Tell me, explain how this. What, this, what is this pad doing? So it's sending out a, re a magnetic field at 6.78 megahertz. Again, an open band. Little donuts here. Yeah, little, yeah. little donuts. And that is resonating with a receiver inside this computer. And by being resonant, it actually can transmit power in tiny little droplets very efficiently and power the computer or recharge it. Now, actually, on. good question. How efficient? Is there, you know, one of the problems with uh, people re refer to with inductive charging is that it's a, not a very efficient way to charge. It's much slower than plugging into into the wall. You're right. You're losing a lot of power. I don't know if you're losing it in heat or what, but you're losing a lot of power. That is not true for magnetic resonance. And today you can buy um, char. It's called power mat. I think uh, yeah, for mat. a car. Yeah. You drive over it. That's right. Magnetic resonant charging, and that's 92, 93 percent efficient. Oh, that's great. Which is not too far off of just a wire that that would that's connect really your, good. your car. That's really good. Yeah. Uh, does it use? If I if I take this off, is it using power now? No. It it communicates to the things that that you want to power, and uh, when it detects that with Bluetooth, uh, low energy. Oh, interesting. Then it turns on to power. So there's no waste when you're not connected to it, right. or your plus, car's not on top. Plus, of it. you could put four things on here; it would charge them all at the same time. They don't have to be positioned exactly, right? Anywhere there. Well, yeah. that leads us to this, which is, I think, this is what everybody would would like at home. This is a table that has the same kind of charging in it. Yes. So this is magnetic resonance charging, and all of the. I'll show you if you don't. This seems like a magic trick. If you don't believe me, here's a lamp. You can see it's on. If I lift it up off the table, it goes off. It's getting, there's no plug. It's getting all of its power from the table. Right. How much watt, how many watts can I, can I drive here? I mean, that's a lot of watts. Yeah, th this is about 200 watts, this table. This table, so it could handle a number of devices. It's powering all the devices on it uh, up to 200 watts total. Yeah, and wow. we could have made it for any, any amount of power. Really? Yeah. Just like the, the car, the car chargers are three kilowatts. Right. Oh, that's a, that's kind of amazing. So this laptop now it would have laptops currently aren't built this way. You you put a, a little. This is a receiver, I guess. Yeah. Here. Yeah. And that and this is an antenna. The table's an antenna, and it's and it's in effect broadcasting power right. into it. And it's paper thin and very inexpensive. Well, to here's produce. here's proof of that. This is a, a blue phone, and attached to it is this is just like a business card. Right. That that's the antenna. That's exactly right. Does, does the phone have to be modified? No, because it's plugged into the regular power source. Exactly. Yeah. It plugs into the USB. <laughs> and so this phone needs probably five watts to charge. That's, it's going to get five watts out of that. Yeah, you can also make it for quick charge 15 watts if you oh, want. Oh, you can do quick charge with it. It would be the Bluetooth would detect whether or not the phone is capable of that and enable that. An Amazon Dot, if I pick it up, it powers down and, uh, and I put it back down. See, I, this is a this. So I could see this as a desk, right in my office. Look at this one. This is a monitor. 
that has no, uh, there's no wires. There's no plugs. I guess you'd need a wire. No, I guess you wouldn't. Nowadays they have laptops and desktops that transmit wirelessly. So you would need, you could have a monitor. Look, it's powering if, up. If you look back there, there's actually a USB port for the wireless uh, signal transmitter so that it can couple into the computer wirelessly. Oh, so it actually has so its own cool. little USB port that's wireless that's as well. That's so cool. So this is, a, this is literally a wireless uh, monitor yeah. from uh, ASUS. Hello. And it's, and, there, and, and you hear the dot just started up. That is so cool. How, is this expensive technology to build? It's, it's certainly not that expensive if you consider all those big AC cords. I have a, a bag of cords that we replaced here. <laughs> These are the cords that so, would be plugged into. So Putting you think about screen. the cost of all this. <laughs> yeah. And I don't know anybody who likes a power cord, so. Get this off your mic. Yeah. yeah. I don't know anybody no, who likes a power cord. And this table just plugs into the wall like a normal device. Yes, and we're actually building one now that the under the carpet we put an antenna, so wherever you put the table, it powers up. <laughs> 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 you don't even need to plug the table in. In fact, why don't I just put the whole thing all through the house? It's completely harmless, right? Harmless. <laughs> so you're gonna eventually gonna have a power carpet. You're gonna have a power carpet and a power wall to put your flat screen TV on. Wow. Uh, and it's all is possible because of fast switching with gallium nitride. FETs and ICs. Correct. It's really, really remarkable. Well, how soon before this becomes the next big thing in microprocessors? Is that, that's, you said it's technically tough? Right, I think in the next three to five years, we'll, we'll overcome those challenges and you'll start seeing it in, in smaller logic devices, maybe right. I.O. devices that right. are very, very speed sensitive. And then, then I call it the Alamo. The, the core processor is the last stand sure. for silicon. But RAM, if RAM, so how much faster would it be if, if you... Well, they already have new technologies for RAM that are a whole lot faster than silicon. Even you, than that. The cross yeah. points. Uh, cross points are yeah. really interesting. Yeah, yeah that's an Intel uh, technology. Wow. Well, we're, we're approaching a brave new world. It felt like we'd reached the end of Moore's Law. We really feel like we've plateaued uh, in, in a lot of ways. Uh, but there is new technology out there that is, that is going to take us to the next level. Yeah, 6,000 times better than silicon that's really, at some point. That's really, really exciting. And I can't wait to have just... This is, this is kind of the holy grail for a lot of portable devices. We, I would love to get better battery life, but failing that, let's, let's, let's at least make it easier to charge it so it can charge all the time. Right, and, and you whenever you set it down. It should whenever be you know, you any horizontal put surface. Put this on your bedside, make this your bedside table. Yeah, that's uh, coming soon. <laughs> Alex Lido, he is the CEO and founder of Efficient Power, what is it, Efficient Power? Conversion. Conversion, because that's what the gallium nitride does. Yeah. And uh, right. thank you for bringing us uh, some real-world examples of how gallium nitride is already in the... Uh, in the world and how it may change the world in the future. We'll have more in just a bit. I love it in our chat room. Missing is saying, why pay for all that stuff when you just get, you know, like a toaster oven and a pot of water for nothing? If you have to ask that question, you're watching the wrong show. <laughs> of course you can. You could also get a Nokia uh, candy bar phone. We just like to spend more money and get more technology, and that's kind of what this is all about. By the way, it, uh, it, we've, we've seared all, seared all the uh, salmon. We broiled it. Just see, the, 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 the thing that we're looking at is how well cooked it is. And we kind of cooked it medium I would say medium uh, rare. You said you like it a little bit rare. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the, the key is it comes out perfectly. Mm. And if you said, oh, no, I would like it a little bit more, then you'd either cook it a little bit longer or at a little bit higher temperature, depending on the... Mm, it is good, isn't it? It is really mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. And the soft-boiled eggs and potatoes. Anyway, that was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And you're right. You're right. There's absolutely no good reason to buy any of this stuff. But... We like For gadgets. Fun. <laughs> we like gadgets. Yes. I like to cook and I like having lots of gear and um, and and then that way uh, there's no room on the counter for anything else. And you use it. A lot of people buy like super expensive stoves I do use it. and like yeah. you know a Viking stove and they don't even use it. You use it. There's you a couple of things home. I don't use as much as I should. For instance, the Instapot. You know that was yeah. very big. I have a Breville slow fast cooker, which is basically a pressure cooker, a slow cooker, a brazier, and a rice cooker all in one. I thought, I'll use this a lot. You know how people go crazy about Instapots. And I don't use it as much as I, you know, maybe a few times a year. So there are, there are things that I get that I just don't find much use for. It's time for the mailbag, ladies and gentlemen. Last thing anybody wanted to do this weekend was eat more after Thanksgiving. 
Here's a, this. We definitely need napkins. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, oh, look, this is really nice. This is pretty. This is one of the new uh, Twit t-shirts. Actually, an older design. Did you do this, Anthony? Yes. I love that. Distressed. That nice it's a distressed Twit logo, kind of crackly. That's intentional. But you can get uh, all of our merch, including the famous Steve Gibson mug, with or without mustache, <laughs> at <laughs> twit.tv slash store. So there's Soft. a good... Soft. Isn't that nice? Mm -hmm. We're using a new provider. This is, is this Haynes? The Loyalist. I never heard of that. We're using a new provider for our, uh, our merch. We don't make any money on it, but it's just a nice thing. We know like, like, lots of people like to give these for uh, the holidays. This is fan mail from some flounder. Pick one. I will start. Oh, okay. Because you have email too. Yeah. That's how it works. I do one, you do two. Okay, got it. If you had gotten one, you would do one, and then I would do two. Hi, Leo and Megan. I've been having problems. With the mail app on my Mac, it crashes. Doesn't that's not good? It doesn't allow me to turn off my computer. I have to force it off on other oddities. Apple says it's Yahoo. Yahoo Yahoo says it's Apple. I want to dump both of them and use Wix as my email server and use the very best mail software possible on my MacBook Pro. Help. I like Apple Mail. I don't. You don't. I don't, I don't use it. So maybe <laughs> that's like why it. I like it. Yeah. Um, I use a, uh, uh, I'm not sure I would recommend it. I use a heavy duty program called MailMate. But I, uh, for me, a mail program is a power tool. And Apple Mail, uh, in fact, most of the mail programs that come with operating systems like Microsoft's Mail are kind of simple for simple people with simple needs. I want something that I can do. Well, for instance, my mail program has to do very sophisticated filtering and sorting because I get a lot of mail and I want to put them in folders. It has to support encryption and PGP and signing. A lot of them don't. Apple Mail does. Actually, Apple Mail does a lot of this. Uh, and, and I want to be able to have very sophisticated searching capabilities. So I use a, a non-free program, but I like it a lot, called MailMate. It's kind of old school mail on the Macintosh. A lot of people use Thunderbird. That's another good choice. There are a lot of good mail programs out there, but wh what do you use? I use email? Newton. Newton uh, Mail app, which I'm not works. I'm familiar with that. It works on uh, the Mac. It works on Windows. It works on your iPhone. Um, it lets you snooze. You know how I, I am a ninja with the email, so it lets you give specific times. I love the things. swiping capabilities. Yes. Yeah. Apple Mail does that too, though. Yeah, swiping, yeah. and then on my Mac, it's keyboard shortcuts mm -hmm. uh, to to snooze until the next day. You know, because really, I I do. I spend every day. I like to spend about twenty five to thirty minutes. I do the like little timer on my mail, and so if I well, can do something in less than five minutes, That's I do great. it. If not, I snooze it till the next day. I like that. Remind me if it's not replied to. Mm -hmm. That's great. You yeah. Can so send it later. I have this tried. is nice. Yeah, it's not free either. Um, it's a subscription service, totally worth it. I have tried probably like, I don't know, two or three dozen different email programs. I've tried a lot of the free ones. and This is more like Apple great. Mail except polished. Yes. MailMate is more like um, a Sherman tank. It's not, it's not elegant, it's not polished. Um, and this actually seems really great. I bet you though it doesn't do some of the things I want, particularly uh, PGP or GPG signing uh, and encrypting of email. And, that's one problem I see with a lot of these new email programs. Mm -hmm. They just don't think this is needed. Notice it does work with Yahoo Mail, so mm -hmm. out of the box. Right. I think that's a very good uh, solution uh, for Natalie. Yeah, Thank I you for the email, Natalie. I and Newton, how, and how much is it? That's a good question. It's not expensive. You no. probably have to buy the I iOS version separately from the Mac OS version. But hey, it, 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 I think it is a subscription service. So that's a little okay. weird. And I could see, you know, I think more and more people are doing that, like Adobe and Microsoft. Mm -hmm. I'm not crazy about the idea of continuously paying for software, but on the upside, at least it means the developer won't lose interest. Right. right. Would you, yeah, or would you rather them be taking yeah. your information and using no. that to support, no. like selling it? Right. Which, yeah. No. No. High screen savers. Hi. Um, I've been using Apple Maps on my iPhone because it's easy to just tap my contacts, address information, and it opens up Maps immediately. However, Google Maps is so much better. How can I get Google Maps to recognize my contact list? At this point, I have to copy and paste the address. Thanks so much. I like Apple Maps, but I get it. I used to use Google Maps. This is very Apple-y, right? Apple says the default Maps program is ours, the default browser is ours. Can you change that behavior? I don't uh, think you can. Well, that's not what it is. They're asking for context. So, like, if I wanted to search for you, and would it show me your address? Like, I don't know if you can see But that But isn't he tapping the address and it's opening it in the Maps program? Well, what, what he was saying was, like, he wants, let's see. 
So if I want to type in, like yeah, I want to find see, your address, I type in Leo Laporte. No, see, I don't think that's what he's talking about. See, he Are says, you sure? yeah, he's, Mark says, it's easy to just tap on my contact's address information and it opens up maps immediately. That's the thing. And by the way, Apple has a patent on this and sued uh, oh, Samsung for I this see. tap to open. So in your messages, for instance, you get a phone yeah. number, you tap it, the phone program opens up. If you get a mess, a, a, an address, the maps program opens up. That's, as far as I know, that's yeah. hardwired. That you, unlike other operating systems, you can't change the default phone application, the default browser application, or the default maps application. So I'm sorry to say, Mark, mm. I, unless I'm wrong, and no. I'd love to be corrected. I, I wanted to answer the question I could answer, which yeah, is how right. can I get Google Maps <laughs> to recognize my contact? Well, how do you do that? You tell us that. That would be useful. <laughs> that's, a, that's a step, uh, right? Well, yeah. I mean, you just, you just do that in settings to allow... Um, no, Android contacts. lets you change the default apps yeah. for some programs, yeah. like the browser and messaging, uh, but Apple never has done mm -hmm. that, unfortunately. No. But there's a so, great shot with my salmon, yeah. <laughs> my potatoes, so you my soft-boiled egg, just and your your phone. If you want to answer the question that I wanted to answer, you go uh, keep searching for contacts, and then Google Maps will say, "Are you looking for your contacts?" and it'll let you add your contact list yeah, to Google that's Maps. Different. That's what I thought that he wanted because I thought that the longer question was that he had like a bunch of different contacts and he wanted to go to each one of their houses. A reason I think I know what he's talking about is because I do it all the time. Don't you do this? You're yeah. in contacts and you, you want to know, well, how do I get to my contacts yeah. house? And you tap it. Right. And unfortunately, I know of no way to convince Apple to open anything but Apple's own right. apps in those situations. Yeah. It's so, just yeah. hardwired. Uh, that is just, that's, that's so Apple. Uh, if <laughs> other operating systems let you change the default, Windows always has, Android does. Apple, even on the Mac, lets you. But Apple on iOS, it's, you know, use our stuff. But, and, you know, I know some people will say, like, I'm an Apple fan girl, but Apple Maps started out really bad, it's but gotten it has a lot gotten better. a lot no, no. better. It in has fact, gotten better. I use Apple Maps a lot because, uh, for instance, I want it to show up on my watch. There's things that Apple Maps does that no other mapping program does, again, because of Apple. But mm -hmm. uh, for that reason, I, I find myself using Apple Maps a lot more than I used to. And mm -hmm. I've never had a problem in the last, I mean, since, since the problems were, what was that, years ago, uh, I haven't had a problem. It's been very reliable, very up to date. So uh, maybe consider using Apple Maps. I agree. I like Google Maps, but in this case, you're going to want to use Apple Maps. I think. Mm. Sorry, unless you want to paste. Well, that's it for our cooking edition. I think we all have to go eat, and you're going to yeah. have to drive me home because I've had a little bit too much of this fizzy beer that you've been making. <laughs> uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we do the new screensavers. Normally, this one we did on Monday because of the holiday, but normally we do it on Saturday afternoons at about 3, 3.30 Pacific. That's 6.30 Eastern Time, 23.30 UTC. If you'd like to tune in and watch live, you can go to twit.tv slash live. You can also, if you're going to do that, please be in the chat room at irc.twit.tv. All that back talk really inspires us to be better. Better. So go in there, irc.twit.tv. It's actually it's family friendly. We've got great moderators. And it's a great way to join a community, get back and forth, and help us because a lot of information that we use comes to us from the chat room. If you can't watch live, you can always go to our website and download episodes, twit.tv for this show, twit.tv slash NSS. Every episode's up there, uh, show notes too, uh, for every show that we do on the Twit Network at twit.tv. But you can also subscribe, and that's what I usually recommend if you use the podcast app on your phone or Stitcher or Slacker or Overcast or Pocket Cast is one of our favorites. Uh, find the new screensaver, subscribe, and that way, as soon as the show's ready, it'll get downloaded right to your phone. We thank you so much for watching, for listening. We we'll hope you come back. I'm Leo Laporte. I'm Megan Maroney. We'll see you next time on the new screensavers. Bye-bye. Have some potatoes. <laughs>